for the sake of our schedule that we have, we're going to be talking about them together and how actually, it's actually going to be pretty cool, <laughs> I'm excited about it, is that one actually, you think of the transfiguration separately, but these two can actually come together and meld together. So let's read what we have for today, which is Matthew 16, 24 through 17, all the way to 17, 1 through 8. So I'll read it out loud. If you guys want to follow in the Bibles that are in the pews, please. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led him up to a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes came as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with them, then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, is it good for us to be here? If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and do not be afraid. When they had lifted up their eyes, they only saw one but Jesus only. So that's what we have for today. Now, it's, we talked about denying, the, the Bible talks about denying themselves, ourselves, before the transfiguration. But I'm going to encourage for us to kind of flip it. We're going to talk about the transfiguration first and then talk about what it truly means to deny ourselves and taking up our cross. So, what did the transfiguration mean? Why was it important in the grand scheme of things? Well, first, the transfiguration was a lesson for the disciples about who Jesus was and his true authority. Now, recall the past couple of Bible studies that Father John and Father Chris did, and recall that the disciples had confessed that Jesus was the Son of God, but they might not have really known what that actually meant. It's kind of confusing, because not only was that confession said, but also Jesus at the same time was discussing about his death, his own death. And for them, this event, the transfiguration, served to confirm Peter's confession that we heard in the beginning of chapter 16. And through this event, Peter, James, and John saw that Jesus was not just an ordinary man, or what they might have thought really meant the Son of God was, but that he was truly the Son of God. Now, if we think about the transfiguration what we read, we saw that Jesus' face was transformed. It was bright as the sun, and his clothes were transformed, and they became white. And if that really wasn't enough evidence to claim him as the true Son of God, a voice came from the clouds and said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So, we had his clothes, we had his face, we had a voice from the heavens saying, this is my beloved son. That pretty much cleared all the confusion that was existing in between all the disciples. Second, the event of the transfiguration confirmed that heaven would be characterized by glorification. As we saw, like I just spoke about, there was a transformation. His face was bright as the sun, his clothes white, a voice from the heavens. There was a transformation coming here. In the transfiguration, the three disciples saw a foretaste of this glory, the glory of the heavenly kingdom. This should be even more clearer to them after Jesus' resurrection, and it was really only then that the disciples began to kind of put it all together. All this confusion, all this questioning was all cleared up. The resurrection occurred, and this is truly, this is truly the Son of God. This is Jesus Christ. But for now, this event had encouraged the disciples. 
Third, this event is the key to understanding the cross of Jesus and his commitment to it. Now, this is where it starts, the transfiguration story and the denying yourself kind of starts melding together. This event is the key to understanding the cross of Jesus and his commitment to it. The sequence of events in the Gospel of Matthew also show us that the transfiguration was to be interpreted in light of the death of the res- and the resurrection of Jesus. There's two pretty much like foretastes that we have that literally sandwich the transfiguration story. We have in Matthew 16, 21, you'll see a little foreshadowing of the death of Jesus, saying that he will suffer. And then we also have the bottom part of the sandwich, which is Matthew 17, 12. So smack dab in the middle, the meat of it all is the transfiguration and denying yourself. So clearly he wanted them to view this transfiguration in this specific context. Jesus wanted his disciples to know that he would indeed be glorified, but not of this worldly glorification where when we say the word king, we think of an emperor, but more of a glorification that is not of this world, that he wouldn't even attain the glory. He wouldn't, there wouldn't be like a vote, like how we vote for the president. There wouldn't be a vote. All right, Jesus, you are the son of God. Yay, nay. It's a declaration where that voice came from the heavens and said, this is my son of whom I am well pleased. Again, the glory that Jesus was to attain was not of this world. The only way that he would be able to attain this non-worldly glory, though, would be through the death on the cross. That's why Jesus committed himself to the cross, and that's why he had that cross, which used to be a symbol of negativity and used to be a symbol of complete disrespect, has now something that we wear around our necks daily. It's something that we look to for hope and for salvation. And this is how we're going to transition to the next part, which is a really big part. And that is what we heard in Matthew 16, 24, 28. We were given another signpost on this path that guides us to the heavenly kingdom. We heard it earlier. Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's will save it. Today and every day, we are called to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow a life towards Christ. Now, within this section, there are two main parts. There are, the verse simply puts it, deny yourself and and take, and take up your cross. But what does that actually mean? As everyone, I'm sure, knows, this past Tuesday, we celebrated Veterans Day. It's a day that we all remember and we all thank the strong, courageous soldiers who live and serve or have served to protect and fight for our wonderful nation, including us sitting here today. We wouldn't be able to do this exact event, me speaking to you all, you looking at me. This wouldn't be able to happen if it wasn't for them. So quick sidebar, is there any veterans or current military personnel out there? Well, if there are, We thank you for your service, and whenever you see someone, please thank them for their service, because again, we wouldn't be able to do what we are doing today, not just here, but any day, going to the grocery store, these little things, without them. So, we have a perfect example of denying oneself in our troops, actually. These individuals give or have given their lives to save and protect the people around them. This is what Jesus is talking about, self-denial giving up ourselves for something greater. When we look at the literal definition of denying oneself in the dictionary, it is defined as a refrain from satisfying one's own desires and needs. We think about ourselves more than anyone else. True, fact. One of greatest today's diseases is selfishness. We had to have fast food restaurants, but that wasn't fast enough. We need drive throughs We had banks bank tellers, we had the drive up bank teller section in the drive through but forget that. We need ATMs. We don't want to talk to anybody. That takes too long. After all, it's all about us, isn't it? Aren't we the center of everyone's universe? We also focus on our own personal belongings. We all have the things we want. The nicest cars, the biggest houses, 
houses on the beach, which are beautiful because they have the nice sunset. Oh, not not here. Sunrises here. I'm from Sarasota on the other side, so we had sunsets. But we all have goals too. We all want to strive to be the best at what we do, whether that's the best lawyer, the best doctor. We want to be the best at what we can do. But Christ is clear that when we choose to freely follow him, truly denying ourselves, that we must first deny ourselves. One of the early church fathers, Caesarea of Arla says, just as we are lost through loving ourselves, so we are to be found by denying ourselves. That means we can't always do what we want to do, which is what our natural tendency is, of course. This means that we will face tough, life-changing decisions that need to be made that go against our own desires sometimes, which is very, very difficult. This doesn't mean that we will be deprived of our own joy and happiness, but we will find this fulfillment, this dedication, this joy, this happiness through our dedication to Jesus Christ. Again, huge take on point here is just as we are lost through loving ourselves, so we are found by denying ourselves. Part two of this section is taking up our cross. It refers to giving our whole life to God, just how God had given his whole life for us through the cross. He bared his own cross for us. Now it is our turn to become cross bearers. During my time at the seminary, which was more recent, I was in a conversation with one of my professors about this section of the Bible. And I asked him, like, what does it really mean to be a cross bearer? It sounds a little intense. Like, I don't, I don't want to say dumb it down, but for the lack of a better term, dumb it down for me so that I can really understand what's happening here. And so he, of course, seminary, made me take out the Bible, and he told me to open it up to 1 Corinthians 13, which is more popularly known for weddings. I read it. This is why it actually got brought up and included in here last minute, because I was like, oh, I read this thing. I recently got married, by the way. Uh, so this was, yeah. A huge thing. And so we look at that passage, and that passage is more about love. And if you guys want to, it actually makes a huge difference. If you want to open up your Bible, I'll read it because it's powerful. But if you want to open up your Bible and see what I'm speaking about, open it up to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 4 through 7. So in this section, we hear love is patient, love is kind. He told me to replace the word love with cross bear. So I was like, okay, so now we're changing the Bible. Cool. Um, So again, follow along or listen as I begin to read this. A cross bear is patient. A cross bear is kind. A cross bear does not envy. A cross bear does not boast. A cross bear is not proud. A cross bear does not dishonor others. They are not self-seeking. They are not easily angered. They keep no record of wrongs. Cross bearers do not delight in evil, but rejoice with the truth. Cross bearers always protect, always trust, always hope, and always persevere. So this message is so powerful because these are everyday things. These aren't, I'm not asking you to be crucified. He's not asking us to be crucified. That does happen, but he's not asking us to do that. He's asking us to take these small everyday things where Could we be more patient? Absolutely. Could we be a little bit less envious? Absolutely. These are the tiny little things that we can do to become cross bearers every day. Not just the one time, not just the two times, but on a daily basis, we can become cross bearers. When you look at the Greek text, for those who speak Greek, but I'll translate and go through it. The words for taking up our cross are now, arato can mean to take up or away, literally. So, the, right there. But there's actually a Hebrew word that goes with it, which is nasa. Now, that really means to expiate sin or remove sin. So now we're talking about a huge different thing, whereas the literal definition of taking up away, which is what it's translated as, but another language uses the word expiate sin. So when we think about what we spoke about above in Corinthians, all these little things that we deal with on a daily basis, 
when we think about it and we pray about it and we become more patient and we become less envious, we are actually expiating sins because we're not focusing on whether this person's got the nicest Mercedes when I'm driving a Toyota Camry or if yeah, this little kid is yelling around and running around church and I'm trying to focus. We can work to be more patient. We can work to be less envious. And we can work to definitely be less self-seeking and overcome these everyday struggles so that we can expiate our sins. In earlier times, like I said earlier, the cross was a symbol of suffering and death. It had such a really bad connotation. It was the biggest slap in the face. It was the biggest disrespect. But through the death of Christ and his resurrection, the meaning of the cross was transformed from something horrible to a symbol that now has become this hope for eternal life. If we choose to deny ourselves and take up our cross, we will see that same transformation within ourselves, just like Jesus was transformed on the mount of his transfiguration. So the big takeaway home point for today is the word transformation, is how we're going to be transformed, how we're going to transform ourselves, but more importantly, how we see these Bible passages and how there's these takeaway points where we can be transformed. So my, I always end with a challenge to you all, and that is to transform yourselves. And that is so that when we go out throughout the week, be a little bit more patient. Uh, the roads out here are crazy, not used to it, and some people get road rage. Yeah, yeah, no, anyone? So be a little bit more patient, be a little bit more kind, be a little less self-seeking, and you'll see this transformation within yourselves. Thank you. Υπότιτλοι AUTHORWAVE <laughs> 